guys welcome to some painty time um, we are going to be making a really pretty floral wreath using masking techniques and watercolors today so the first thing I'm gonna have you guys do is cut down a piece of watercolor paper for yourself that's roughly 12 by 12 11 by 11 something to that um, degree or measurement and then you want to find yourself some sort of a bowl or plate that you can put down and still is going to give you at least like an inch and a half of room all the way around it that way your flowers have room to kind of spill out past that and then you're going to find the rough center of it if it's not exact don't worry about it it's totally okay and very very lightly sketch in your circle with your pencil to give you a nice guiding wreath shape to begin with. Now once you have your wreath, you can start thinking about how you're going to build your bouquet on it. Um, as you know, the peonies and the mums come with some deliciously large peonies and chrysanthemums and they're absolutely sensational on larger scale wood projects or on furniture. But for our purposes, we're gonna go with all the smaller ones today. I do have kind of a mock-up of what I've done in the past where I do larger scale projects of watercolor. And this was a two by two piece of wood. So, you know, it's kind of nice to be able to use those big guys and have them take up a bunch of room quickly and easily. I'm gonna use this peony to begin with. One of the other things that's wonderful about this one and this one is they have an arched stem on it already. So that will be absolutely fantastic when we're setting it up around our wreath. So you can get that shape to kind of follow roughly around the line of your wreath. So I'm going to start off by stamping that one twice. I love this one. Now as you're stamping, you can choose whatever color you'd like. For our purposes today, I'm gonna go ahead and do black, just so that it shows up nice and crisp on camera. And I've secured the stamp to one of the IOD grids, which I'm crazy about. I never was very much a fan of large acrylic blocks, largely because I felt like I could never get a good impression. I had to stand up and lean over the stamp. And this is just lovely to not have to do that. I can sit down and use a mild amount of pressure. All right, I'm just turn this. Fantastic. All right, and let's pick another one. Let's go with one of the moms. This one is just so yummy because you have the little stamens kind of in the opening of the mouth on it and they're just beautiful. I can go off a little bit and kind of eke into the corner of my page while staying on my wreath form just so I fill up my space and space and it doesn't get too matchy matchy you know you want to keep your bouquet nice and loose so that's a big gorgeous one we'll use just one of that I think I'll use, yeah. So on this sheet, it has kind of a smaller and then an even tinier one there. I'm gonna use those.
So while I'm inking up and stamping, um, it should already be listed in the supply list for this course, um, but I am using a permanent ink pad and I am partial to archival ink um, on watercolor paper and that's basically a Ranger product. Archival inks come in a wide variety of different colors. So there's a sepia brown, which is absolutely fantastic, and the black. The reason I like these inks is they're really juicy, so they pick up all of the details in a stamp without, um, what's the best word for it? Um, without um, leaking or, or bleeding when you start adding paint. There are other brands like Versafine, which are sensational for details, but they're not necessarily perfect for watercoloring because they're not permanent. So I love the archival ink when I'm watercoloring. And basically what happens is you heat set it for a couple of seconds with like a drying tool of any kind and it sets it and then you don't have to worry about it bleeding on you, which I love. All right, I'm gonna do this other furfully little guy. And he's great because he can just kind of pop in. We're gonna sneak in some leaves. Actually, you know what? I think I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off on this guy. I want way more leaves. I love the leaves in these sets. They're just gorgeous. Okay, so the one I picked out was this one here. It's a little bit on the kind of shapely side. It's not huge and it kind of curves nicely. So before I can stamp the leaves, what I wanna do is I wanna find the corresponding um, masks to go with the flowers that I've already stamped out. And these are coming with the a, a good amount of the IOD stamps now. So it's just wonderful. Okay, that leaf is perfect, so that's a match for that guy. I'll go ahead and set that one aside. It's just wonderful for layering all of your pieces. Okay, this one is really close. Do I just have it in the wrong direction? Yeah. All right, so that one matches that. And then I've got one more chrysanthemum. Carefully put these away. Sometimes it helps to write down the name on your mask with a Sharpie and then make sure they go back into the right bag so that you don't lose them. Ooh, we know we're going to use this one in just a bit, so I'll set that one aside too. And there's the mask for that guy as well as this one over here. So we'll just use it again. And I don't necessarily need any of the other masks at this time. So let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and do this one. Make sure it's nice and protected right over my stamped image. So if you can't see, let me get in here a little closer. You can see the sheen of the mask. So right here on this guy, if I just swivel over just a little bit, you can kind of see the mask was there. So I'm just hovering the mask right over my stamped image. This way, I can stamp all around it, get beautiful peekaboo details behind it, but not have it go into the actual stamped flower arrangement. I'm gonna scooch this over just a smidge so I don't mess those up.
We'll steal the mask and shift it over to this one here. one more. Again, the masks kind of wiggle around on you a little bit, so just periodically check them. Make sure the alignment is good so that you don't accidentally stamp into your flower. So I could have used a variety of different leaves, and imagine if you were working on a really large piece of wood say like two by two or three by three, you could really get wild with your leaves. I just tried to go as simple as possible. You know, it's sometimes when you're just learning the techniques, you don't need to get all crazy detailed and make it all challenging. All right. Fantastic. So now we have our lovely stamped wreath. And I think, you know, you can decide what's right side up and what not. Now, the one thing I will say is I want a little more peekaboo kind of popping out details here and there. So let's see, maybe I had that other little peony bud, which was really cute that I was hoping to use. I'm not so sure it's gonna fit. Okay. Might make it a little too busy. Yeah, I think it's too much. You choose what you want and what you don't want. You know what I mean? Less is more is typically my rule of thumb but you do whatever feels good to you. Okay, so I'm making sure that my masks go back into the right bags. And I seem to have already lost one of my bags. <laughs> it always happens. All right, so I've got the mums. And then I've got the peonies. Um, you know, everybody kind of has their little rule of how they store their, their bits. Um, but one of the things that I like to do is keep the original bag, the little acetate bag that your, um, your stamp came in. And so my large masks that don't fit into a Ziploc bag can actually go into this one. And then I put the smaller ones in the smaller Ziploc bags and into this one. So. You know, do whatever works for you. I'm gonna set my stamp aside. We're gonna pause for just a minute, heat set our um, stampings, and then come back to it. Okay, so excuse the slightly darker lighting. I had to unplug one of my lights so that I have another outlet for my heat tool. Your heat tool is basically like an embossing gun or a hair dryer. The rule with a heat tool is you should always be a fist width away from your piece. That way you don't accidentally burn your paper. So I just hover over the entire wreath for approximately six to 10 seconds and then that's heat set enough for me to move on with the painting.
Okay, so if you have heated and dried your piece and your paper is bowing up, don't worry, it's totally okay. My trick for this is literally just turning it upside down and heating it from the back and it tends to flatten down nicely. Easy peasy. Love that. All right, let's go back to having some better lighting here. Fantastic. Okay, so we'll start in stages. Um, depending on how much of a perfectionist you are, you may or may not want to uh, race your pencil line from your original wreath shape. As an artist, I typically keep my pencil sketches visible. It doesn't bother me to see them. In fact, I kind of like them. Sometimes I'll go back in and I'll reinforce with a bit more sketchy effect. But for our purposes today, we will erase the pencil. Keep in mind the oils in your hands act as a resist to paint, okay? So don't don't put sweaty hands on your paper or, you know, like for instance, just kind of flick it off really quickly, nice and easy. I have a lot of paint colors because I'm a watercolorist and this is what I do for a living. So don't, don't expect that, you know, you're gonna be like watching this tutorial and you're gonna think, oh my gosh, I don't have all the paint colors she has. I can't do the lesson. Look, you can get really far with a Crayola paint set. You would be absolutely blown away at how much variety you can get from just a basic Crayola set. I also have some sort of a palette, just kind of depends on what's handy for me. I have a variety of different palettes. Um, you know, they kind of just come in lots of different shapes and forms, but right now I'm gonna go ahead and use this guy. And I don't rinse it, like very often I will just leave the paint in there. This is all perfectly good paint. I don't need to rinse it. I can, if I need just a little bit of green, well, heck, I've got like four different variations of green here that I can pull from. So don't feel like you have to wash your palette when you're done. Unless you're sort of a neat freak and you like nice and clean, I totally get it. All right, first things first, let's lay down some of our flower color. We're gonna start with a really light wash of color. This means I want to have plenty of water on my brush. Let me see if I can't get a wide enough view where you can see my water and my paint. There we go. All right, so a nice belly full of water on my brush. And when I refer to a belly, I mean the entire tip of my brush. The belly is in the center. It holds the majority of the water. So by loading that with water, I have plenty of water on my brush. I'm gonna go ahead and touch what's referred to as quinacridone rose. In most sets, it's basically the kind of um, rose colored paint color. It can be referred to as permanent rose. I wanna make sure I have plenty of water on there. This is a light wash of color. And I'll just start by throwing down a little bit here. I'll put a little over here and some here. That's the concentrated puddles of color. Then I'm gonna rinse my brush and with water, I'm gonna gently bring that concentrated color out to the edges. And what it'll do is the paint will disperse and break up and you'll have darker puddles of color, lighter puddles of color. You'll have little blossoms in your, um, in your painting, which basically means water blossom kind of disperses the paint out to the edge. Those are all things that I actually really like in a painting, so I'm not a super, super detailed artist in that regard. I really like things loosey-goosey. I can come in with a bit more concentrated color while these layers are still wet. Just kind of drop them in. Don't overthink it. 
Just play. So I've got really delightful wet into wet, darker puddles of color kind of filtered into some of these softer washes. These are gonna create some really beautiful interest in our flowers as they dry. Again, really concentrated color. I'll rinse my brush and with water kind of softly drag that out. Okay. This is all one color, but it looks like a lot of different colors, right? That's just the difference between having your paint be at full capacity, full vibrancy and color, and then adding water to lighten it. As we get closer to the center of the flower, it's probably going to be darker because that little bud is more tightly wrapped in there. So there's more shadow and it's darker in color. You see more transparency in the petals when the flowers open. Okay, so we have our first perfectly delightful peony. It's a nice start. We'll go back in and add some more layers to that in just a little bit. Little bit. Pick up some sort of a green for yourself. Okay, I'm gonna rinse my brush, pick up a little bit of an, a yellow, and while that green is still wet, I'll touch my yellow right into the green so they, they touch and they kind of merge and meld. You can even pick up a bit more green, kind of do some little fungal spots just by dropping in some wet into wet color into those. I'll go a little more concentrated for the stem. And I'm gonna make a, an intentional boo-boo here in just a second, and you'll understand what I mean when I say that. So I have a puddle of rose-colored paint here that's still wet. I'm going to intentionally touch my green to that pink section. And then I'll kind of tilt and allow some of that color to go into the petal. It's very, very common to see reflection of green leaves onto your petals. Again, it just adds more interest into the flower itself. It's also a really good excuse if you're just learning to paint and having a hard time kind of controlling where your color is going. You can just say, I meant to do that gives you a bit more freedom and you're not stressed about painting perfectly. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna skip this one and this one and move on to the next flower or leaf available. That way the two don't accidentally bleed into each other. They have their own personality, so each one will be approached a little bit differently. All right, so this one I'm gonna go ahead and use a bit more of, it's a yellow ochre. Okay, again, I'm just gonna drop in some concentrated color in some of these petals, rinse my brush before they dry, come in with water. And fill them in. The really cool thing about mums is there are so many different flowers. I mean, so many variations of color with that flower. So you really, honestly, you could do any color you wanted to, including something that's not terribly natural. It doesn't really matter. In fact, I did um, blue poinsettia 
at Christmas time and had a blast with that, incorporating the woodland um, blue jay into my poinsettia wreath. So sometimes it's fun to be a little bit adventurous. Okay, while that's still wet, some of them might be dry and that's okay. I'm gonna pick up a color called New Gamboge. It's a very orange yellow. And I'm just gonna drop in some of that wonderfully vibrant orange yellow into some of these petals. Again, it's just gonna give a bit more interest, depth and variety to my painting. I'm not filling in, I'm not covering up all of the yellow that I just laid down. I'm just dropping in some of that yellow to create some interest and variation. You don't want this to be too matchy-matchy. Okay, we'll come to this other peony. Now for this other peony, one of my absolute favorite color mixes to create this great little peach color is cad red. So it's like a tomato red with a cad yellow, and that is a real sunshiny, vibrant yellow. Mix the two together, and you should get a bit of a coral color. If you need a bit more yellow in there to lighten it, feel free to do that. Then what I'll do is I will dilute this with at least a full belly of water, and it gives me a gorgeous peach color. So I'm going to use that one for this peony over here. That way it doesn't match the peony I have on the other side of the wreath too much. Again, we really, really want to have some um, individual personality to all of these petals and flowers. No two flowers are the same. And it's just far more interesting to look at when they don't look too matchy-matchy. Okay, now I'm gonna pick up a little bit more of that real vibrant cad red, put it on my palette, not too concentrated. There's still a lot of water in that puddle. And I'll just kind of drop in some of that red into my base color. And with watercolor, it just kind of, it just does its thing. It's very organic, it flows all over the place and just makes it way more interesting. You can kind of chase it around with a bit more water on your brush. Leave a couple of really dark puddles of the color in a few spots. Those will soften as they dry and become really, really interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna move on. Let's choose a slightly different green. If you only have one green in your palette, consider adding a little bit of brown to the green. On another leaf, mix a little bit of your green with some yellow. That's really the only difference for me is that I've got lots of different greens that are already mixed up, but I could mix them very easily just by adding a little bit of brown, yellow, sometimes even a bit of blue. They just look a little more interesting when they're not all exactly one color. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause for just a moment and I'm gonna dry these up 
with my heat tool, a fist width away to make sure that I don't burn it, and then we can start tackling some of these other items that are right smack up against the flowers we've just done. Okie dokie, we are back for our next set of flowers and leaves. Let's start with this one here. Oh, I'm thinking we've got a yellow kind of goldy one here. Maybe some sort of a vibrant red. So I'm using cad red, but I'm diluting it a little bit. Oh yeah, we need to dilute that like crazy. Okay, so I'll throw a couple of splotches of color down into some of those petals, rinse my brush, and with water come in and soften up that splotch of color. As long as you work quickly, you can get to those little splotches before they dry completely. Now I recognize I work really, really quickly. My students tell me that on a regular basis. I'm like Speedy Gonzalez with paint. So don't feel like if you're not keeping up with me that there is something wrong. There most definitely is not. I just work pretty quick. Now if you notice, what I did is I just did the curled top on these petals. I'm gonna do the inside of the petals a slightly different color because they would look different in nature. More times than not, the curled over portion is a little bit more shadowed and the inside is a little softer. Sometimes it's the reverse. There, um, a little bit of paint got out of my petal here. I'm just going to come in with some water and kind of softly scrub at it and spread it out and what it'll do is it'll add a slightly um, shaded area to that petal but it won't be super bold just in case you make a boo-boo at any point. And again as we get closer to the center of the flower the darker the petals tend to be. So I'm not as concerned about diluting as much as I get closer in here. You might want to consider shifting down to a slightly smaller brush. If you need a bit more control working in a tinier area or flower. Periodically turn your work as you're going because uh, sometimes it's easier for you to get to a specific flower or whatnot. It'll be the difference between you putting your arm in it. And trust me, I've had plenty of paintings where I dragged my arm through something I just spent a bunch of time on and it drives me bonkers. So we're gonna let that dry up a little bit and we'll scooch over to the leaf between these two. I used one type of green and some yellow on this one so I'm just gonna mix things up and choose a completely different color green. Again, I don't want them to match too much.
You can get a green like this by simply mixing your green in your palette with a bunch of yellow. Now I'm gonna mix in some burnt sienna, which is a nice brown. It's kind of a brick brown, and it's very, very common in just about every basic paint set that you can buy. So I'm gonna mix a little bit of that brown into my leaf. I know that sounds kind of weird. You might be thinking, why are you doing brown? Well, there are a lot of brown leaves and there are a lot of fungal spots in leaves as well, which means, you know, it could be a fungus is growing on the leaf or it could be that it got burned from the sun. Whatever the reason, adding in some kind of unexpected colors like that make your wreath even more interesting. Okay, we'll turn it again, come back to this one. Again, I'll pick a totally different green. Rinse my brush with water, come in and push that paint around some more. Let's see, I'm gonna drop in this is called Aussie Red Gold. Any kind of a gold color would work, even yellow. Pick up some more of the original green, kind of deepen some of the areas. Again, this is wet into wet, so my base layer was still wet, and I'm dropping in more paint while the base layer is still wet. Shift again, new green. You can reach this type of color by taking your green and mixing in some gray or even some black. Picking up another kind of brown. Rinsing my brush, coming in with water, intentionally adding in some little water blossoms. Kind of stirring those colors together. Don't, don't get too crazy, because then you get muddy and not, not in a good way. There's like intentional mud and then there's mud that's just where you've overworked the color too much. And you just, you really want to kind of just let it do its thing. I'm going to drop in some more of the uh, dark green that we originally went with. Coming back to my favorite green. Not sure that I mentioned the color. This is called Green Appetite. A 
and I'm just going very concentrated on this one so it's a lot darker than some of the original ones I used. And I'll come in with a slightly different yellow on this one. Cool. All right, so we have some really nice interest on here. Now it's time for us to make some um, second uh, layers of color on our flowers. So on this one, I'm going to use alizarin crimson. It's a slightly cooler red. And what I'll do is kind of in the areas down at the bottom or maybe towards the inside um, bud center of a flower, I'm going to add in this slightly darker red rinsing my brush and I'm gonna kind of just slightly touch the edge of that so that it softens the edge and you don't have a really hard line. And by that I mean, if I were to drop in color down here, you can see hard edges and lines to that. But if I rinse my brush and come in with water, I soften up the edge and make it blend into my flower just a little bit more, okay? So we'll do that again. We'll make this little bud a little bit darker in the center there. And then I'm gonna introduce a little bit of yellow very, very common to see yellow in the edge of your petals. They've aged, they've gotten a little sun scorched. So adding a little bit of yellow into the tips is just a really neat way to add some interest to your petals. And if you notice, I'm kind of working in little sections. The little channels aren't necessarily touching where I add the color. So already that flower that was really flat and didn't seem to have a whole lot going on has a lot of interest going on right now. Right here on the leaf, I'm going to add in a little bit more of that yellow ochre color. I'll pick up a little bit more green and I'll just do a couple little spots. Maybe a little softening of the edge, but not too much. I want to leave those a little bit darker and more bold. Same thing with this leaf here. I'm just coming in and adding in some darker shadowed areas. One of my favorite things to do is to splat. Love to splat color. So I'm just gonna splat a little bit of that brown directly over my wet layers. And they kind of just disperse and do all kinds of lovely things. Plus the little speckles of paint look ridiculously cute. And I'm just coming in with some water right now and splatting over my splats and they do this kind of runny little spot which is called scumbling essentially. Okay, so again I'm gonna swivel some more. I'm gonna come back to my new gamboge and I'm going to punch up the color on some of these petals. A lot of the yellow mums are like super, super sunny and vibrant. So I really wanted to play with the yellow on this so that it was really, really vibrant. And some of these, like this little swoosh of color here, I'm not even gonna bother to soften it or rinse it. I'm just gonna leave it just the way it is. As I said, I like little splotches of color and interest. 
come in with another really vibrant yellow, slightly different, but still full of sunshine. I think it's really important to just be as playful as possible with watercolor. Um, you know, for that reason, like my style is very loose and not super serious. And I think sometimes we think, gosh, well, that's not real painting. Yes, it is. It most definitely is. It's just a completely different style. And I find that this is way more free and fun. I get less stressed out about painting when I'm able to just kind of live outside the edges and not necessarily be too perfect. So I'm going to come in now and splat again with some more color. This is Quinn Deep Gold. So all of those yellow layers were still wet and then you can see kind of the splatter sort of settle in and start doing its thing. I love that. Okay, turning one more time, coming back to this cute little peachy guy. Let's see, I think we need something more magenta-y. So I'm gonna use some Bordeaux. It's a very, very bold color, so I'm going to dilute it a little bit. Again, I'm gonna do that bud in the center a little bit darker. Come in and sort of soften up my edge. Down at the base of my peony, I'll drop in a little bit more of that kind of bold magenta color in there. Add some more sunshine to the leaves. Just kind of dropping in some more yellow. All right, we've got some good layers going on. Now we need to come back to this chrysanthemum. Um, for the inner part of the petals, I'm gonna go with my alizarin crimson, which was my slightly cooler, darker red version. The color we used on the outer part was actually a very warm red, so very tomato-y. The cooler red has a bit more blue in it, so it's, it's a good color to kind of suggest a bit more shadow, because you tend to have more grays and purples and blues in your shadows. So I love mixing my cools and my warms together. And if you just want to be like, to heck with the cools and the warms. I just like these colors and I like putting them together, then do it. Sometimes you have to take a couple of seconds to look at your petal and kind of determine, is that connected? Is it not connected? Otherwise you end up painting something that isn't there. You paint something on another part of the flower you didn't mean to paint. So just sometimes step back from your work and kind of reevaluate. I'm gonna mix a little bit of brown in with my uh, alizarin crimson and coming up with kind of a burgundy color. And like I did with a few other flowers, add in some darker patches of color. Soften the edges on them. Don't soften the edges. Leave them big, crazy, bold splotches if you want to. It's really up to you. I'm gonna come back in to the, do the same thing with this one again. I 
like I said, just be adventurous and kind of play with these layers. I think you'll be really happy with where you get. By not taking it too seriously, you know? All right, so we've got lovely splatter up here on the top left. I wanna do a little bit of splatter down here. And to keep it cohesive, I'm gonna use the same color I splat there over here. And I'll totally do it right over my little red flowers. I'm very okay with that. So now I'm going to go ahead at this point and dry up my wreath and come in and do some fun little details. Okay, so we're going to come in and start adding in some details. <clears throat> there are a few areas that I wanted to add a bit more watercolor after looking at it. And again, sometimes just taking a moment, stepping back and looking at your work kind of help you decide what you want to tweak or add more. Another little thing that I like to do is take a photograph of my work and look at it in a picture. And for some reason, the things that I don't like or things that I thought I might have missed or something like that, they just sort of pop up in the photograph and sometimes it's just easier to see them. I'm not sure why that is, but it it's a pretty helpful little thing I do often. Okay, <clears throat> so my watercolor brushes. I never, 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 my good watercolor brushes never use acrylic paint with my good watercolor brushes. So I have a, a set that's just for my acrylic. And honestly, you can use cheapy sets. You don't have to use anything super fancy. One of the things I like to do is come in with like a super bright white acrylic. And you could have one of the cheap um, folk art brands. White paint is white paint, guys. Really, you don't have to use expensive golden like I'm using. Um, this one in particular, it is referred to as a high flow, so it's like a really runny acrylic. So you have to give it a good shake and you can hear the little balls inside of the container helping to stir the paint up. So you give it a good hard hit, make sure that it is really well mixed. And then I can kind of twist my little top and squeeze out some white paint for myself. Okay, so I'll come in with my white acrylic and just start adding in some fun little details. Reintroducing white is one of my absolute favorite things to do because your eye is naturally drawn to the white areas. This is very much a personal style. It's not something that's for everybody. Well, not the reintroducing of white. I mean, artists have been doing that forever, but just the way I'm applying it and the places that I'm applying it, those are all very much a personal style choice. And I'm not doing it everywhere and on every single petal because then it looks too intentional and you really want this to feel organic and Every flower petal wants to feel special and have its own little personality.
Okay. I'm gonna rinse my brush really, really well. And I'm gonna pick up a kind of a random color. of acrylic. I really like the kind of gold touches. It's um, Quint Deep Gold is a color I use in a, a ton of my watercolor. It's just my bag. Love it. And you'll find that as you progress in your own artistic journey that there are colors that speak to you and that you, you will use them more frequently in your work. So for this, I'm just going to kind of come in and add some little flourishy like details. So kind of just periodically take and turn your piece and just do little feathery details. They just really soften up a piece and kind of fill in anything that may or may not need a little zhuzhing, you know? All right, so that is that. I hope you guys really enjoyed the painting with me. Um, I do lots and lots of other classes, far more in depth on each of the petals. Um, if you're really interested in seeing the watercolor kind of progress. Um, and then I do more of the um, IOD home decor with like a more extensive online classes as well. So if you wanna follow me, give me a follow on Instagram or on Facebook and kind of keep up to speed on my classes. Again, like I said, I hope you enjoyed using all the new IOD stamps. The chrysanthemum and the peonies were just absolutely delightful. Um, and then, of course, the masking. You know, we can always use a little extra help with our masking, um, given that it is a fairly new technique for a lot of you guys. Funny enough, it's one I've been using in the craft industry forever. We've been using it in stamping, but we didn't have fancy masks. The IOD girls just spoiled us with all kinds of fun new um, substrates and tools. So... Have a fabulous day. I look forward to seeing you guys again. Happy painting.